Apple finally allows emulators and makes a big oopsie. The PS5 Pro, we know the details now, and Nvidia still burning up their graphics cards, and it's a big problem. Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news that I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Tuesday, April 16th, 2024. We're gonna start off today with something that was exciting a lot of people a few weeks ago, which is that emulators were finally gonna be allowed onto iOS. This is thanks to the EU embarking upon new legislation against Apple, Apple making emulators available worldwide, and they let in IGBA, which is a Game Boy advanced emulator that you could even download ROMs within, but it turns out that uh, Apple may not be the best arbiter of deciding what apps are allowed to go on their app store. We actually did a video on this a few months ago about how Apple let in a vision testing app that actually was just a hub for piracy, and this is coming off the backs of their app review system, where they vet the applications that go on to their app store. And if you've talked to any developer, they have special contempt for Apple's specifically when it comes to the rules and regulations of the App Store. But turns out this IGBA was completely ripped off of another Game Boy Advanced emulator that was made for iOS, but had to be sideloaded, known as GBA for iOS. So after IGBA gets pulled, Apple says, hey, don't steal other people's stuff. And then the developer of GBA for iOS says that he's kind of upset with Apple because this is on them. He's had his app ready to go on the App Store for quite some time. This is happening because they've refused to allow emulators until very recently, and this is something that could have been prevented. And if you're wondering about the person who copied the code and released IGBA, they said that they did not think the app would have so much repercussion, I am really sorry, and that they reached out to the dev for GBA for iOS on the back end to see what's happening. But regardless, this is just a big oopsie overall. Apple says that, hey, we can't allow certain things on our app store because it's not safe for you the people. We have to be the ones who are in control because otherwise you have an unsafe and insecure experience. Meanwhile, when they finally allow this thing that they say that they've been preventing you from getting, it turns out to be a really bad thing, but they vetted it. That was, it was part of their protocol and they did not do a good job. I don't have much to say about the situation beyond like, what the, what are you doing, Apple? But if you're the kind of person who wants to play a bunch of retro games, I bet you store them. I bet you have them on a hard drive somewhere. I bet you love spinning platters and you want more of them. Well, today's video sponsor has the perfect solution for you. Silverstone has a modern NAS case that you can get in their CS382. They've been making NAS cases for over 10 years, starting with their DS380 in 2013. This new CS382 is a compact micro ATX case that's the culmination of everything that they have learned over the more than a decade they've been producing these. It has eight hot swap bays that can support up to two and a half inch and three and a half inch drives up to SAS 12 gig or SATA 6 gig. And all of them can be locked behind a beautifully designed vented and filtered front door that also keeps access to buttons and IO ports safe from intentional or accidental access. It's got other cool features such as a five and a quarter inch drive bay for further storage expansion, a slim optical drive bay, a long graphics card or RAID card support, a USB-C port, large air cooler support and liquid cooling support up to a 280 millimeter radiator. The CS382 is a modern NAS case of your dreams in case you want to store all of your files and your goodies and the things that you hoard in your data. This is this is the case for you people who like to make sure you hold on to everything. And in fact, I, since I've seen the CS382, I, I have been contemplating. Maybe we do a NAS build here at UFD Tech. What do you say, Kyler? You in for a NAS build? Yeah. We'll see how far I get with that idea, but if I do it, it's gonna be in the CS382. So big thanks to Silverstone for sponsoring today's video. You can check out the CS382 at the link in the video description. And you can also check out Samsung. Look at how fast they're rocketing back to the top on the number one smartphone situation. They're the number one smartphone company in the world. They defeated Apple, that evil company who took the top spot at the end of 2023, but now they are down in the year of 2024. Even though the smartphone market has 
has grown this year. It turns out that Samsung's the one who's benefiting from that growth and Apple is not. And now Samsung has 20% of the global smartphone market and Apple sold 55 million units in the first quarter of last year. And now they're down to 50 million units in the first quarter of this year. And the biggest reason that this is happening is that Apple had a huge surge towards Q4 of last year. They definitely saw a lot of sales propel them at the end of the year after the launch of their iPhone 15 lineup. It does kind of make sense that Samsung would be coming back on top in Q1 of this year, specifically because they had their S24 Ultra drop. So this kind of back and forth does make sense. Apple is down overall. I think a lot of people got the phones that they wanted and they're not necessarily continuing to upgrade. But just because Samsung's back on top doesn't mean like the ebbs and flows of the regular smartphone market are changing. Besides the fact that the people who are in the next three spots are kind of curious. You have Xiaomi, who's in third place, Transient or Transcyon is in fourth place, and then Oppo is in fifth place. Oppo also owns OnePlus. Transient, I had never heard of them before, but it turns out that they're a Chinese company who sells phones like Techno, iTel, and Infinix. Again, companies that I've never heard of, but that obviously doesn't mean anything because there are so many large smartphone markets outside of the US who have companies that aren't global. But we are gearing up for the global launch of the PS5 Pro, and The Verge actually got hands on the documents that are specifying exactly what Sony is going to be doing with that device. So you already had a kind of an idea of what Sony's aims are for the PS5 Pro, specifically what they're trying to do with ray tracing and their PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution, all of that. But now there are actually more concrete details coming out from Tom Warren over at The Verge, who has seen the document and gave us some details coming out from that, which include the fact that they're targeting about 45% faster on the GPU side for the PS5 Pro. That's not necessarily any new information this version is just supposed to be a high-end PS5. It's not going to unlock, you know, 4K, 144 FPS gaming. This is just supposed to be a PS5, but better. Hopefully, the price aligns with something that makes sense with that. But the big change here is that the CPU is also going to be upgraded in a specific way. That was actually one of the deficiencies of the PS4 Pro was that it got more GPU power, but the CPU was still very hampered, so you couldn't do a whole lot. But now with the PS5 Pro, it's going to have a 3.85 gigahertz CPU frequency mode, which means it gets about 10% better performance on CPU that's being unlocked, or it can run at the standard PS5 3.5 gigahertz in case developers want that to happen. But in the unlock mode, that does come at the cost of GPU power. However, they're saying it's roughly 1% lower performance because it's 1.5% downclocked on the GPU. So it's negligible to get more oomph out of the CPU, which can be a limiting factor in a lot of these scenarios. Additionally, PS5 Pro is going to have faster memory coming in at 576 gigabytes per second, as opposed to the 448, which Sony says the bandwidth gain may exceed 28%. And they're also going to have a higher amount of system memory available to games coming in at 13.7 gigabytes versus the 12.5 that's currently on the regular PS5. And that this could all just really allow for better ray tracing, better upsampling, better super resolution, making it so that a game that's supposed to run at 1080p 60 can more easily run at 1440p 60, or if it's already running at 1080 60, it's going to be able to do that with full amounts of ray tracing because the ray tracing support is supposed to be about three times as good. All of this is neat. All of this is cool. I honestly can't say whether or not the PS5 Pro is going to be a good decision by Sony until we hear about the pricing. If it comes in at the price point of $499 and Sony decreases the price of the PS5 Slim down to something like $299, that can make it all sensible and make it make sense in the current console ecosystem. Anything higher than that, I think they the highest they could reasonably go is $599. But other than that, I think they're just uh, shooting themselves in the foot with uh, being disconnected from what consumers want. But uh, we'll wait and see. But you know what consumers want? They want more Reese. That's what I hear. More! Rip Reese's voice. Now you're stuck with me, the backup voice. First up is this Corsair High Performance Mouse Pad at 50% off that you can get for $5. Next up is the Corsair K70 Pro Mini Wireless 60% RGB Mechanical Keyboard. It's $72 off at $108. Lastly is this Longer LK5 Pro 3D Printer. It's 23% off going for $290. And now I'm going back into voice storage. 
Well, Reese, it turns out Tesla employees are getting a bum deal because they're announcing layoffs. 10% of the global workforce is getting laid off at Tesla, which amounts to about 14,000 employees. However, with that is coming the loss of two key executives at the top who are not being laid off, but are choosing to leave the company. One of them was a senior vice president of powertrain and energy, which is a big deal in everything that's going on with their development of EVs. And then as well, a VP of public policy and business development. They are also gone. Elon Musk saying that there's nothing that I hate more, but it must be done about every five years. We need to reorganize and streamline the company for the next phase of growth. This is coming after the company did not grow in Q1 of this year. They definitely sold fewer vehicles, even with price cuts and a lot of incentives that they've been trying to give. Additionally, it's being reported that they're not going to come out with their $25,000 EV. However, there is some sort of robo taxi announcement that's supposed to be happening in August. But also on the backs of this, Tesla is having the subscription price for full self-driving. It used to be $200 a month. Now it's $100 a month, which shows that they're kind of uh, trying to get people to sign up for this subscription. However, in case you want to buy it outright, it's still $12,000, which is just, I don't understand how that financial breakdown works or makes any sense, but it's what they're doing. However, they're also having some problems with their Cybertruck. They're having to halt deliveries of this behemoth of a vehicle due to an unexpected delay of the fact that the accelerator cover just slips off and then can get lodged in the footwell, making it so that you just accelerate and hit objects. There's at least two reported accidents that have happened because of this, but it seems to be something that they are doing wrong with it. these trucks at the factory. They're not adhering the acceleration covers properly so that's slipping off on a hundred thousand dollar truck and that delivery should be done and back on april 20th which so it's only a few days but because they didn't fix how you make the car go and nvidia is not fixing how they make the card go with power because Northridge Fix coming out with a video talking about how they repair roughly 240 90s a month thanks to the fact that the 16 pin power connector is still melting. Now a lot of this is off the backs of Cable Mod and their adapter which has been officially recalled and discontinued and Cable Mod has actively worked to make sure that people stop using this. However, users still are going to use it however they want. But that is not the only reason why these connectors are melting. It just appears to be a very bad format for all of that power to get delivered to these graphics cards. We've talked about this at length previously. However, there is a new dimension that's being added into this, not just the fact that Northridge Fix is releasing a video talking about how they're repairing GPUs every single day due to Nvidia's malpractice, but also the fact that because of the 4090 export ban to China, this is actually creating a problem for Chinese customers who have purchased RTX 4090s. They can no longer get their cards replaced they can get them fixed and that could potentially solve issues if something happens with their 4090. But if their card actually dies, they cannot get it replaced. At most, they can get a refund if they submit it back to like Taiwan or something like that. They cannot actually get a similar card. They would have to get their cash back and then go purchase a 4090D for the exact same price, which we've talked about previously, can be overclocked with the new BIOS and make it so that you get close to 4090 level performance, but it is still a lesser card, especially when it comes to the raw specs that you're getting. So this is an issue that's going on over in China and with the cards that are burning up, the power connectors melting and people are having losses from their cards. This just appears to be a big bummer all around and Nvidia may want to consider not doing this for the 50 series. Maybe they give us two 16 pin power connectors that split the load, make it so that you didn't have to change it. But now that you did change it, you kind of just F fix it even worse. I don't know. I'm not a physics, but you guys are physics. You tell us everything we do wrong here on Hot News. So let's read the comments on Float Plate. We got Hal15900 saying, I'm sorry, not getting in the marketplace does not mean Linux is not ready. From a technical standpoint, I think Linux is functionality ready as a daily driver desktop OS for nearly everyone. It is just the marketing that is not a strong aspect of open source, which I wasn't talking if it's technically ready or not. I'm talking, is it reality ready? And if we're talking about marketing and implementation and people actually going out of their way to use it, it's in reality, not suitable for a mainstream adoption at this point. Maybe it could be soon, but it needs some sort of external pressure to come and actually make that happen. I am not talking about Linux's capabilities. I know that people can argue back and forth that Linux is the best operating system all day long, but 
In reality, people are not using it because it is not ready for them in the ways they need it to be. And you can disagree with whether or not they should need it to be that way, but that doesn't change the fact that it is that way for them. And then we got Dappenage saying, while I do understand praising Apple for the steps they've taken, it's one of the biggest companies that exists, not a kid you're teaching to be better. I think Apple is doing the least they possibly can rather than what they should do in regards to their device being able to be repaired. I think this is just a fundamental disagreement with how we're choosing to view the situation. I don't think Apple is a child who's trying to be raised to be better. However, I do recognize that there are real people who are working at this company who are trying to make real changes from the inside out and to discredit the advancements that are being made discredits actual real people's works. But then on the other side of it, this is not the least that they could do. They could be doing less. And I think that's something that uh, like they could be actively doing more to fight everything. They could be actively doing more to subvert stuff, but they are begrudgingly going along with it, which um, while again, not ideal. And uh, honestly, I would argue they need to do more. It's not the least they could do. It is definitely still above that. Then over on YouTube, we got original screen name saying the PCMR crowd needs to realize that they're not the majority when it comes to how PC users think about computers. I learned that when I sold computers for a few years and saw how much people wanted to run away from the conversation if it got any more complicated than asking about the few programs they use, which 90% of them would tell you I'm not a gamer to avoid being sold high end. The majority does not have the patience to learn Linux. They barely have the patience for Mac OS, which is likely only gaining ground because of Microsoft pissing people off. I hear you. I get the argument. I don't like an argument that's based on the the flaw of the masses meeting with people it's just it's it linux doesn't meet a felt need that's that's what i can bring it down to and then when it comes to the adoption of mac os i think that actually if i if i'm gonna argue based on what i'm seeing in the data and what i'm seeing with people that i interact with in reality it has less to do with the cell of the operating system and more to do with the cell of the hardware the macbook lineup is more compelling for a lot of people due to marketing, due to the sleekness, the form factor, the easily availability at every single store that they could possibly go to, and the simplicity of choice. The The fact that there's not that many options when it comes to just purchasing a MacBook, but when you walk into a Best Buy, there's half a bajillion different Windows laptops you have to choose from. Simplifying and saying, hey, for $1,000, you get this MacBook Air. This will probably do everything you need it to do. That is probably where I would suspect a lot of the adoption of macOS is coming from rather than people choosing to install macOS. It's more of a hardware switch than a functional software switch, which is one of the reasons why I like the Steam Deck so much. It, it actually implements software in a hardware form factor that makes it accessible for a lot of people. And I think that's probably gonna be the way that it needs to happen for more people to adopt Linux in the future, which again, is not where it's currently at, even if technically it could be there. Then we got Funny Hat saying, I wouldn't use a Google VPN even if I was already paying for it. it. Just seems like a way to even more directly give Google even more of my data. You don't want them to have it? What are they building all those data centers for? They need your data, please give it to them. And then iOS kind of backing me up a little bit saying, Linux is ready. The issue is people don't install OSs. They just go to big companies and buy computers and almost everything is Windows and Mac. So I, like if it was ready uh, uh, for, for like mainstream deployment, I would like to see it happen. Like the mainstream devices running it. And I know we're not there yet. It's not actually happening. And then Rayox saying, I don't think dropping a hundred dollar deposit counts as a pre-order. You're right. It, it's not a pre-order. I just mentally think of it that way. I've committed my heart to an Aptera and I gave them a hundred dollars saying, hey, I would like this vehicle. It is refundable. So that's kind of the, the reassurance I have. I did not have money to invest in the company. Um, and so I just say, hey, I would like this vehicle when it becomes ready, please let me give you my money in the future. And then user with a bunch of symbols saying, who else wants EVGA to team up with Intel? I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people were hoping that when EVGA left Nvidia that they would come back in a couple of years potentially for Battle Mage and make it so that we get one of the greatest AIB partners, but just with a new GPU company. We'll have to see if that happens. And we got the big Merc saying, maybe Reese will come back to the States if he knows that they sell a Mountain Dew Baja Blast in bottles now at stores. Come back, Reese, we miss you here in the States. I bet you he wants Baja Blast, but I also, I don't, they'll be back here in the States at some point. He's, his visa's not expired just yet. We can make, we can try to get it. We'll see if it, I, I would like him here. I want Reese to be here. He's not here. I know, I'm sad now. Thank you, bye.